Book of Mormon, number 22, Messiah 25 through 28, the power of a true king and a father's prayer. I think you're going to enjoy this. This is Prophetic Appointments, and I'm Pharaoh. And I'm Rhonda Pickering. And welcome to our Come Follow Me. And we got some really cool chapters going on today. Hard to mess up with the Book of Mormon and all that, right? Okay, so we have been working through the Book of Mosiah and these incredible flashbacks and uh, complicated storylines that are just another evidence that it probably wasn't written by a backwoods boy in uh, upstate New York yeah. in the 1820s. I, I think a lot of people going through the Book of Mormon for the first time have a hard time keeping up even with the storyline here because of the flashback. So we're going to have a flashback here that we've seen in Mosiah. There's going to be another flashback in Alma when we're working in all the missionary journeys going on there. So we are covering chapters 25 through 28 here. So you can see the people are gathering back in to Zarahemla. King Mosiah and Alma are going to lead the people. And we're covering all the way through Alma the Younger Kind of take it over. Yeah, when when she says flashback, I, I think of meanwhiles, because when we're talking about um, Daniel's numbers, we do a lot of meanwhiles, meaning the half hour silence, we have meanwhiles going on. So right. it's the same concept. You have to go back and pick up the storyline in another location type thing. In review, we had two groups of people that we talked about last time that kind of were a type of how we might handle a difficult time, period of time when we might be in bondage. And we even talked a little bit about how in some ways that bondage is real already. Um, but the first group was the people that were blinded, it tells us in Mosiah eleven twenty nine, and did not believe Abinadi. And so this group in Isaiah is our group of survivors. These are the people that God will hear and he'll take them through it, but um, they haven't fully trusted him and they haven't, I, I would say the difference between those people in Isaiah that are e the elect and those that survive is that the elect sign up to help, right? And they, they're more concerned about others than themselves. And so they are going to have a different scenario, a different level of covenant happening in the end time. And this, of course, is a type and a shadow, as most of the Book of Mormon is, just like all of the Isaiah, uh, a picture of the end time using historical types from the past. Mormon, because he has seen our day, he's seen us and he's trying to give us types through types and shadows and historical situations, just like Isaiah, things that will help us in the end time. So the people of Zenith are left to defend themselves against invasion, and they get betrayed by their own leaders. They are finally rescued uh, under Mosiah II. He sends Ammon and 15 others, and then Gideon is going to come up with the, a plan to, to escape. So they'll be blessed in their efforts here. And we get this recap in Mosiah chapter 25 as King Mosiah is reading Zenith's account and, and the account, Alma's telling of his account. And the response of the people in Zarahemla is interesting because they isolate the, the groups as well. In verse 8 and 9, it says, For they knew not what to think, for when they beheld, those that had been delivered out of bondage, they were filled with exceedingly great joy. But again, when they thought of their brethren who had been slain by the Lamanites, you remember they, when they thought of the brethren who had been slain by the Lamanites, they were filled with sorrow and even shed many tears of sorrow. It seems like God's people are constantly being um, shadowed by people who have almost hatred towards them constantly to keep them 
humble and turning back to God all the time. Right, and, and I see Our day, this, Israel. Yeah, I see this all the time in Scripture. Well, how about all the time in current events? That it really does take the opposition. The, the ones that are really faithful, the ones that love the Lord, are the ones that saw the price that was paid for freedom. They're the ones that understand what the dark side looks like enough to appreciate and love the light. You're gonna, we're going to see, see this with Alma. You know, Alma is going to be totally rebelling, uh, having been delivered um, as a child. But he <clears throat> is going to rebel against his, his father. And that's crazy. I mean, a dad like Alma Sr., and it, it's going to give us a reason why. But the point is, is he's going to have a, a, an experience of hell. And when you have that kind of knowledge and that kind of experience of the other side of it, it's a life-changing event. All right, so the second group of people was Alma's group, Alma Sr. And they were the ones that believed the words of Abinadi. And they left voluntarily with Alma Sr. and were preserved through their faithfulness during trials. So sometimes we get the idea that if we're faithful, no trials. Yeah. God's gonna got us and we're not gonna have to experience anything. But the reality is that it is through the willingness of the faithful to go through trials and to do it praising God and without murmuring. It's that that gives power to save others. And so this is what we're going to see um, in Mosiah 25 verses 10 and 11. It, the people there in Zarahemla say that when they thought of the immediate goodness of God and his power in delivering Alma and his brethren out of the hands of the Lamanites and of bondage, they did raise their voices and give thanks to God. Remember that Alma's people didn't have to fight their way out. The Lord told them, you're going to be delivered on the morrow. And then they, they just left while the Lamanites were in a deep sleep. And the Lord actually told them that he would stop the Lamanites in the valley two days journey from, from where they left. We don't get told in the Book of Mormon how he stopped them. I always hoped that would be in the sealed portion is when we get the rest <laughs> of the record. When they thought upon the Lamanites who were with their brethren of their sinful and polluted state, they were filled with pain and anguish for the welfare of their souls to love your enemies to the degree well, to really what we're talking about here is loving the souls of men uh, if you look at mankind as an enemy you don't recognize the need for our repentance in every enemies don't stay enemies always a lot of times it's just like the first group they were blinded by the idea that they should follow King Noah and they should follow the priests and, and that the hierarchy could get corrupt wasn't in their paradigm and enough to recognize truth when it was being told. This is something can happen to everyone. And the fact that there are people willing to be filled with pain and anguish and try to save souls is the heart of the gospel. A friend of mine that came and showed me a uh, as I was talking about the two different groups, he was saying, you know, really there's a third group. As I looked through the scriptures, there really is a third group that's involved here. And it's Noah, Amulon, and the wicked high priest, the ones that actually killed Abinadi. Yeah, the ones who actually later become allied with the enemy. Right, the and enemy. they're, they're going to have all these machinations and, and, and secret plans and secret combinations and... <sighs> And they're, they're going to kind of wheedle their way in to power uh, to the point where Amulon actually persecuted his fellow high priest severely. That was one of the trials that Alma and his people bore patiently and, and with praise. They will be hunted down and destroyed after they show their true colors. And we'll, we'll get 
to the rest of that story in Alma 25. But we do have even an element of those guys, the wickedest group that get saved. And, and particularly their children. And if you kind of look through the Book of Mormon, even when um, the sons of Mosiah go out on their mission, missions, they, they don't have any success converting these apostate Nephites. They, they, they only are able to reach the hearts of the descendants of Laman and Lemuel that hadn't apostatized but had just been involved in the traditions of their fathers. Amulon and the high priest went and they took Lamanite women and kidnapped them and took them for wives. And in Mosiah 25 verse 12, it says, and it came to pass that those who were the children of Amulon and his brethren who had taken to wife the daughters of the Lamanites, they could be reached, it says, they were displeased at the conduct of their fathers. Yes. And so what you see here in this type in shadow is that when, you know, it's kind of like the one that founded Richard Wormbrand. What was the name of his organization that he founded? Voice of the Martyrs. So um, people that have endured severe persecution like, Richard Wormbrand and he who founded the Voice of the Martyrs and and you hear of these people who willingly testify of Christ in situations where they know that they will be persecuted for that have borne testimony that it was that was the only way the Lord could reach some of the most wicked for them to be in those circumstances and to praise the Lord in the depths of darkness and that people are reached in those places by the faithfulness of the saints in their bondage and in their and their persecution and often they are delivered from that and they are able to go where the lord needs them to go so i love the fact here that it says that they are numbered these believers even in the the wickedest places become numbered with the people of god and this is very similar to isaiah 19 when it, it lists the three branches in the last days that are gathered back in it says egypt my people so those are zion on in the americas and we have israel my inheritance so we have the old jerusalem there but the third group that represents the 10 tribes says Assyria. And you think, oh my gosh, wait a minute. The king of Assyria and Isaiah, he's the bad guy. But there are people in his land, in his society, in his society that I would say are displeased with the conduct of their leader. Right. And in the battle there, in the conflict, in the work of the two hands, the left hand and the right hand, they come to Christ. And, and that's this third group. And there's a type and a shadow of it right here in the Book of Mormon, as well as in Isaiah. As we go through um, these few chapters, uh, I, what I wanted to do is, is show a couple of the chiastic structures that are in here because it gives you the things that Mormon is arranging as a focal point. And as we're learning that the sons of Mosiah and Alma are rebelling against their father, it says it that part of the reason is because they were of a rising generation that did not understand the words of King Benjamin. And so, you know, I think I think of today, I think people that hear, oh well. Abraham offered Isaac, um, well, that's human sacrifice. And, you know, people take things out of context and they totally miss the point of what was trying to be said and what was trying to be taught, that the Savior would be that offering for us. And Isaac was a type of, hate of the Savior. Instead of understanding it, they take it out of context and make it into something 
that they feel vehemently that they need to oppose. And that is where Alma Jr. and the sons of Mosiah went. And they did not understand the words of King Benjamin, being little children at the time he spoke to the people. And they did not believe the traditions of their fathers. And they did not believe what had been said concerning the resurrection of the dead. And neither did they believe concerning the coming of Christ. And now because of their unbelief, they could not understand the word of God. And their hearts were hardened. Well, Mormon has taken the time to put this in a chiastic structure to tell us that there were two very important things that they did not believe. So what are they? They're in the center there. Well, they didn't believe in the resurrection and they didn't believe in the coming of Christ. Obviously. So they didn't believe in future prophecy, the coming of Christ. And in a way, would you say resurrection is a future prophecy too? No, oh, for sure. I, you know, and that, you know, as we look at this whole thing, you, you can't help but just see our day and realize this is talking straight to us with this generation we're in a lot and everything that's going on. Now, as we're talking about this resurrection, we can bring out the point that we know that we're going to have a group of people that, that are going to be converted eventually by the sons of Mosiah and Alma who are not going to fear to lay down their lives voluntarily in hopes of a better resurrection and that they will not pick up the sword or slay their brother in hopes that they will have a chance to repent. And so what I'm saying here is what, what we're about to start seeing here in the Book of Mormon is people that are willing to lay their lives on the line for a knowledge of this resurrection. And belief in a resurrection to come, belief that Christ is real, these things make you live your life differently than you would. And I would say that it's one of the most critical doctrines of the gospel is that there is a resurrection and Christ can redeem us in that resurrection. And it was actually, as I was studying the feasts and, and everything that I came across a verse that actually changed my paradigm and how I interpreted and understood prophecy. And that was this one, DNC 63, verse 51 through 53. And I want to note, I want you to notice that it also talks about here the resurrection of the dead and the coming of the Son of Man. So it's a kind of a parallel verse to this, but listen to what it says. Wherefore, children will grow up. It's talking about the millennium. And they will become old and old men will die, but they won't sleep in the dust. So there's death during the millennium. Death isn't conquer, um, death isn't done away till the end of the millennium. But it's a different kind of death during the millennium. Because just like it says, but they don't sleep, they don't sleep in the dust. When they die, they're changed in a twinkling of an eye. And then it's the most fascinating verse because I was fasting and I was praying for the Lord to please help me understand the prophetic appointments, the feasts, what, what they represented. I wanted to, to understand it. And, he's, and he, I read this verse and it, it just, all of a sudden I understood. And this was the verse, it was verse 53. For this cause preached the apostles unto the world. It seemed kind of odd that we're talking about being changed in the twinkling of an eye. And then it says, for this cause, the apostles taught the resurrection of the dead. And then it says, these are the things that you must look for. How many of us look to the resurrections? I'm afraid only those of us that are coming face to face with our mortality. I think that in our everyday run of the mill busyness, we don't look for the resurrections. But speaking after the manner of the Lord, they are nigh at hand and in a time to come, even in the day of the coming of the Son of Man. And so when I read these verses, I realized that 
the prophetic appointments are all about the resurrections. Oh, That's okay. what the Lord is working toward each harvest. Yeah, and it's it's a rehearsal of those resurrections or those appointed times. Right, and the whole reason we're planting and watering the crops and weeding the garden is to get the harvest when the season in the end comes and he brings the harvest into the garners. So those harvest times are resurrections. What's fascinating here is that the angel is actually going to tell Mosiah about the resurrections here. We have concern that we've established the church and what do we do with transgressors? That's the question that is asked. It's Alma. Here in Mosiah, Alma has established the church in Zarahemla so that those people, remember Limhi and the group that had escaped with Gideon and Ammon had not been baptized yet. And, and he's going to get instructions on how to establish the church. And the Lord is going to tell them about the transgressors in the terms of a resurrection. So here it says in a chiastic structure in 26 verses 21 through 28. And he that will hear my voice shall be my sheep. Now you can see here in the top half of the chiasm, it's about the people that hear his voice. In the parallel uh, part in verse 28, it talks about he that will not hear my voice. So you have an interesting chiasm here. You have the top half being those that are going to have a place at the Lord's right hand. And in the bottom half, you're going to contrast that with the opposite. We're still in a chiastic structure, but it's an antithetical. It's contrasting opposites here. And so in element A, where the title of the top is, you will hear, they will hear my voice and be my sheep. And in the bottom, it's you will not receive, I will not receive them because they will not hear my voice. For behold, this is my church, whosoever is baptized unto repentance. In element C, for it is I that taketh away the sins of the world. It is I that created them, and it is I that granteth unto them that believe unto the end a place at my right hand. I will freely forgive them, and it is my right to do that, it's I that do it. I that took upon me the sins of the world. That's what gives him that right. Now, if we look at element C down below, you have that emphasis again, that it's I that am the Lord your God, and I am your Redeemer. God doesn't tell them that, that doesn't judge them. They judge themselves. It's they that refuse to be redeemed. Be prepared to jump in and answer that when I ask you. So in element C, you have that same emphasis that it's I, the Lord, your God. I am your redeemer. You have that same authoritative emphasis. Up above, it said, I will freely forgive. But down below, it's really not God that's judging them. Do you see what it says in element C at the bottom? Yeah, and then they shall know that I am and the Lord their God and I am their redeemer. They would not be redeemed. Even they, they chose out. Right, and so really we are the ones that judge ourselves. To a large degree. Then it says, as we move towards the center, it says, if they know me when they come forth, if they are called in my name, they will have a place eternally at my right hand. Now the contrast in element D for the bottom half is that they that never knew me will come forth and they will not be redeemed because they chose not to. That's a pretty sobering thought. But notice here in the center, both of them are talking about a resurrection. One is a resurrection for those that believe in my name. And then it says there's 
a second trump and a resurrection for those that stand before him that do not know him. And this is very similar to what we just read when we read about Alma and the sons of Mosiah. They didn't understand the words of King Benjamin. They didn't, they, they didn't know him at all. All right, now, the, it said that those that do know his name will have a place eternally at his right hand, but look in element B what happens to those who never knew him. And then I will confess unto them that I never knew them, and they should depart into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Well, that kind of sounds harsh, don't you think? Um, I guess it's perspective, right? Yeah, I think so. They chose out, but they get to have time out with the devil and this angels, so they'll choose in. It's actually kind of the last chance to <laughs> say, of, hey, this plan didn't work very good. <laughs> it, it's their opportunity to get a reality check because they hardened their hearts. They would not be redeemed, and they wouldn't take his hand. So the only option he has is to let them work for the one they chose to serve and get a reality Find check. out how the wages work there. And I did want to emphasize, um, you can study this through and check it out in your own scriptures, but there's some, there's some linking words here that are very, very important. They should have reminded you of a story in the New Testament. I hope that you were thinking of it. It says, some are going to be in the right hand, and some are going to depart into everlasting fire. Do you know what parable it is? Does anything come to mind? Are you thinking? All right, before we jump to that parable, I want to show you what happens to people who utterly reject Christ even after the time out. Okay, in the very end, I wanted to show you that the, the word phrasing is different than, than those that actually, I mean, really what, what we're talking about here is going to hell. These ones go into the lake of fire and brimstone, and that is different then departing into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Here, Jacob makes it really clear in his temple sermon in Jacob 3. Oh, my brethren, <clears throat> hearken unto my words. Arouse the faculties of your souls. Shake yourselves that you may be awake from the slumber of death. And loose yourselves from the pains of hell that you may not become angels to the, the devil. devil and be cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So getting a timeout with the devil and his angels is different than being tossed back in to the fires of, re of meltdown and, and dissolution. Right. Okay, so one is the second death, one is a timeout. Losing out. complete identity. Right. And, and I'm just showing you that departing into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels is actually a timeout during the thousand year millennium. And I'm about to show you in that parable that there, those words should have been ringing some bells. And that's going to be in Matthew 25. And it's going to be the sheep and the goats. The sheep go on the right hand. And what happens to the goat? Well, in order to see what happens to the goat, you'll have to wait till the second half because Matthew 25 verses 31 through 48 on the sheep and the goats is a chiasm just like the one the angel just gave Alma. You're going to have what happens to those on the right hand in the first half, and then you're going to have what happens to those who are wicked in, and don't believe in the second half. But when we put both of these together, we're gonna see a bigger picture. So let's take a look. Since, since DNC 63 said the resurrections are what we need to be looking for. So Alma Senior gets that little chiasm about the resurrection and what to do with the transgressors. It's gonna be on Alma's mind clear till you get to Alma chapter 40 and he's going to tell his son who's wondering about the resurrection you know 
I was wondering about that too. Dad got this little clip and I had to ask the angel to explain more about the resurrection. And so Alma 40 is going to be all about the resurrection. And we're going to see here that the sheep are on the right hand, just like it said. It said that they, they hear my voice, they're my sheep, right? And they come forth on the right hand. And in this chiastic structure, we're going to have the division, the choice, and then we're going to have B and C about the righteous. And then in the second half, we're going to have B and C about the wicked. And then we're going to have that choice again at the bottom. So it's kind of got the same kind of similar framework. And it says, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. These are the guys on the right hand. Thus said the king to them, they're on his right hand. And then it's very interesting that the checklist is six items. I thought it would be seven, but it's not. It's six over and over again. What makes it almost temporal. Well, it makes it part of mortality. Where you're actually doing something physically for people. The 6,000 years of man, you know, the 70,000 years is the Lord's. But so six is kind of a, a, a mortal mankind number. And there's six tests, six questions that are given to both, both sides. When I was hungry, did you give me meat? When I was thirsty, did you give me drink? When I was a stranger, did you take me in? When I was naked, when I was sick, when I was in prison. So this is mm. the criteria in, in every case. This is how we're sorted. It's not just believe in Christ, but this is telling us what believers in Christ do. So you're getting both sides of it here. And it says then... Reminds me of one of the beautiful songs Joseph Smith loved so much, Poor Wafering Man of Greed. And then it says the righteous are going to answer him and they're going to say, wait, when, when did we do hunger and thirsty or um, stranger or naked or sick or prison? Same six, same order. And then we get the climactic part of the first section. Go ahead and read it in element C. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Insomuch as ye have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And that that's the emphatic point. We have like this A, B, C in the first part, and then an A, B, C in the second part. That's called a chevron, like uh, when a military person has those slanty stripes on their shoulder. Those are chevrons. Um, so po in poetic language, these are this kind of organization is a chevron. All right, let's move now and see what he says about the goats. And you can see we're still talking about the sheep on the right hand, the goats on the left. If you look down at the bottom, you're going to see that clear in verse 46 at the very end. It says, and these, the goats, go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous, the sheep, into life eternal. If you notice that it did sheep then goats and in the end it does goats then sheep, that's doing a crisscross making an X. John the Revelator does that often to emphasize that point. So here's our chevron for the goats. It says these are the guys on the left hand and then what I wanted you to see is the exact phrase that the angel gave to okay. Alma. Didn't do. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. That's exactly what we saw in Mosiah, given to Alma by the angel. And then he says, For I was hungered, and you gave me no meat. And I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. And we go through the hunger, and the thirst, and the stranger, and the naked, and the sick, and the prison. Exactly the same. Same order. I wonder if the writer of, oh, poor wavering man of grief, he probably you know, themed a lot of them. Actually, well, of course, but I, but what I wondered is if the verses are in order. Actually going I know. I'm like, I'm going to check that out next time we sing that. So here it is when they respond back. It's in the same order. I bet you Hunger, it is. I bet verse. you that inspired the song. <laughs> well, I know it inspired the song, but I don't know if the verses are in the same order. 
hunger, thirst, stranger, naked. I almost sick. gotta look it up now. Prison. Like but here's the climactic point of the chevron, and go ahead and read it. I'm not sure where. In element C again. At the bottom. Uh -huh. Insomuch as ye did not to one of the least of these, you did it not unto me. And these shall go into everlasting punishment. Now, this particular uh, parable, the sheep and the goats, is at the beginning of the millennial day. This is deciding who will get to inherit the kingdom, the millennial kingdom, and who has to depart into the timeout with the devil and his angels that are being bound. All right, so I, you know me, I like the kids. So this is my cute little bookmark. You got the sheepy on the one side, the goat on the other side. But what I want you to see is the contrast. Depart versus inherit. Left hand versus right hand. Cursed or blessed. Gave me no meat. Gave me meat. Gave me no drink. Gave me drink. All of this is in contrast so that we can see what it takes to believe unto the end. Now, from Mosiah chapter 26, we can actually add some because that chiasm is a contrast as well. Those that would not be redeemed versus those who are baptized unto repentance. And we can add these to our sheep and goat list. Those who will not hear my voice, those who will hear my voice, those who never knew me, those who do know me, and those I will receive versus those I will not receive. Now that you have all of those word links, we can take those will hear my voice and will not hear my voice and take them straight into 3 Nephi chapter 15. We can take they that never knew me and they that know me into other parables that are talking about whether or not you know him and you if you start linking all these together, you start having a beautiful picture of what the Lord wants of his sheep. And it's really beautiful. And, and the reason we did this whole exercise is because I want to inspire you, if I can, to pay close attention to the word linking. That phrase was a direct quote from the angel that Jesus is going to emphasize here in the parable of the sheep and the goats. And, and once you see it, you can start seeing that they're all in parallel. In order to understand the different resurrections, you have to take the phrases that pertain to each of those resurrections and link them through scripture. Now, it was interesting that in the one in Mosiah 26, where the angel was telling Alma he, when he got to the goat part of it, the wicked part of it, he said that it was the second trump. And the one thing that I wanted to caution you as, as you're linking throughout scripture, when you have things being numbered, like first trump, second trump, or the last day, or the last dispensation, sometimes it's from the frame of reference of the person that's talking. So you can have the last dispensation re being referring to this last 6,000 years and the restoration of the fullness of the gospel. But technically, the last dispensation is the seventh dispensation. It's the millennial, it's the millennial dispensation. So you can find verses in scripture that will refer to both of them. And you have to keep them in context to what's being talked about. And just to illustrate that, I was showing you that that second trump that the angel was referring to with Alma, remember that, that that was being revealed before the first resurrection. Jesus hadn't come yet. The, the resurrection at the time of Jesus' crucifixion hadn't happened yet. In the frame of reference that the angel's talking to Mosiah, Jesus' resurrection will be the first trump, and then this is the second trump. This is the one that comes at the end of the 6,000 years before the millennial day when they have the sorting of the sheep and the goats. So it's the second trump in that frame of reference. But in DC 88, Jesus has already come. And we're talking about the resurrections that take place at Adam on Diamond. And we have 
another set of trumps. And so here in verse 99, it says that this, at the second trump, then cometh the redemption of those who are Christ at his coming, who have received their part in prison. So these are the guys that got imprisoned between that first resurrection and now we're at the second trump and they've had their time out. Maybe they're ready to receive Christ at this point. These are those that are Christ that is coming who have received their part in the prison which was prepared for them that they might receive the gospel. That's how come we know the time out is a blessing because these guys are receiving the gospel that didn't receive it at the first trump and they will be judged according to men in the flesh. And then there is another trump in DNC 88 is those that are found under condemnation and they live not again until the thousand years are ended. So here again is another reference to the second trump. At the beginning of the millennium, this third trumpet says, and they live not again until the thousand years are ended. So we know it's at the beginning of the millennium. And then this one says that there's a fourth trump. They've had that whole time out from the first time when Jesus was resurrected to this resurrection at the beginning of the millennium at his second coming. And it says they got to remain until the great and last day, even to the end. And they are filthy still. That was a 2000 year timeout between Jesus's resurrection and this resurrection at the end of the 6,000 years at, at his second coming. But apparently there are some who will remain filthy still. Now, I just am showing you again that throughout scripture, there's different sets here. You can tie them together with a linking word. Just be careful for your frame of reference here. In DNC 19, it says that he retains all power, even to the destroying of Satan and his works at the end of the world and the last great day of judgment, which I will pass on the inhabitants thereof, judging every man according to his works and his deeds, which he had done. The resurrections are all over the scriptures. And we kind of, we're kind of sloppy in our studying. We just kind of read through them and don't do the work of lining them up and figuring it out. And surely every man must repent or suffer. For I, God, am endless. Wherefore, I revoke not judgments when I, which I shall pass. But woes shall go forth, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, yea, to those who are found on my left hand. So again, we're using all the same imagery. That weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, boy, that's a fun one to link up through scripture when it says that. But you can even do the woes. The woes are the woes of the trumpets in Revelation. The first one when the demons come out of the abyss. And the second one is Armageddon. And the third one is the earthquake at all. We read over this stuff without doing the work to link it together. And so I'm encouraging us to do that because not only do we have Alma and his son worrying about the resurrection, but when Jesus comes in third Nephi, what's the first thing he says? He, when he reads their records, you missed something. Oh, good faith. He talks about Samuel the Lamanite. He says, Samuel the Lamanite prophesied that there was a resurrection when I came. Did you write about the resurrection? And they're like, no, we didn't write about the resurrection. <laughs> That's why it was so important because it's all about the resurrections. All right, big rabbit. Now, we'll, now we need to go into the most amazing chapter, Mosiah 27, when the angel comes in answer to Alma's prayer and kind of sets Alma and his buddies straight. It says, and this is kind of an interesting, for he did go about secretly with the sons of Mosiah, seeking to destroy the church. Mosiah had passed a law that you can't persecute people for their beliefs. So they're going around secretly. They're pretty determined to fight against this misunderstanding that they have <laughs> of what the gospel teaches. And they were seeking to destroy the church and to lead astray. 
the people of the Lord, contrary to the commandments of God and even to the king, as they were going about rebelling against God. Okay, this, this puts them in that third group, that where they get hunted down and destroyed. <laughs> I mean, this is a, a serious thing to be doing. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto them, and he descended as it were in a cloud, and he spake as it were with a voice of thunder, which caused the earth to shake upon which they stood. And of course they were dumbfounded and they fell to the earth. But before we leave verse 11, is there any other verse having to do with Alma and a voice of thunder and shake the earth? And we're gonna have to jump ahead again. But this is one of my favorite verses, one of my favorite songs. Oh, that I were an angel. So after he has been preaching and persecuted and, and done everything in his power to tell the people that hell is real and he believe in Christ now, he says this in Alma 29, verses 1 and 2. Oh, that I were an angel and could have the wish of my heart that I might go forth and speak with the trump of God with the voice to shake the earth and cry repentance unto every people. Yea, I would declare unto every soul as with the voice of thunder, repent. What's he talking about? He said, I would do to them what the angel did to me. <laughs> Wake up. He's praying <coughs> that prayer. Now he, he chastises himself for praying that prayer and says, nope, I'm praising God. I'm thankful for what I have. They don't believe me. <laughs> they persecute me. I'm not that powerful angel. But no righteous prayer goes unheard. And Alma is going to disappear and not die. I wonder if Alma maybe can come and shake a few of us up a little bit with that voice of an angel that can shake the earth. All right, in verses 13 through 14, it says, nevertheless, he cried again, the angel, saying, Alma, arise and stand forth, for why persecutest thou the church of God? For the Lord hath said, this is my church, and I will establish it, and nothing shall overthrow it. Here's the painful part. <laughs> Save it is the transgression of my people. Do we realize that nothing could overthrow the faithful people of God except for their own transgression? And again, the angel said, Behold, the Lord hath heard to the prayers of his people. So that would probably include King Mosiah and his family and also the prayers of his servant Alma, who is thy father. Mm. For he has prayed with much faith concerning thee, that thou mightest be brought to the knowledge of the truth. Therefore, for this purpose have I come, to convince thee of the power and authority of God that the prayers of his servants might be answered according to their faith. So this is an incredible example that we have in the Book of Mormon of the prayer of a father of the Davidic covenant. So just for a minute, let's examine how this is an example of a Davidic covenant because we have to understand it. If we don't understand the Davidic covenant, we cannot fulfill our mission in the last days, according to the Book of Mormon. Now the Davidic covenant is a Lord, Father, Servant, Son relationship. It's a covenant relationship between a father and a son. Jehovah, Psalm 110, said to my Lord, sit at my right hand 
until I make your enemies your footstool. So this is David, and Jehovah is his Lord. And, you know, Jesus is going to use that verse to <laughs> trick up the, the scribes and the Pharisees who don't want to believe that Jesus Christ was David's Lord. He, David, will cry to me, You are my Father, my God, the rock of my salvation. Notice the legal terms here. Psalm 89, verse 3. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to David, my servant. Jehovah said to me, You are my son. This day have I begotten you. Okay, so you have to pay close attention to the use of this term. When the 2,000 stripling warriors call Helaman their father. father, there is a covenant in effect here, not a vertical covenant between the, the sons and Helaman, but covenants with God the Father and Helaman as their father. If he is faithful to God under all circumstances and they are faithful to him, God is bound by covenant to protect the sons. And we're seeing this same kind of covenant going into effect here with Mosiah and with Alma. This is some verses about Hezekiah. Hezekiah is an example of a righteous king. And, and all of this is going to lead right into Pharaoh's lesson, which is the next one, which is about kings and governments. But you have to look at it on two levels. We're not just talking about a temple king. We're talking about a king in a covenant relationship, a king and a queen in the house of the Lord, and their power to affect covenants on their posterity, on their children, on a city, or on a nation, depending what level of covenant keeping you have done. So here we see in Isaiah 37, which is the threat of Jerusalem's destruction by Assyria. The, remember the king of Assyria is surrounding the city walls and he's threatening to wipe out Jerusalem. The Lord says in Isaiah 37, I will protect this city and save it for my own sake, for my name, my, my people Israel, not because <laughs> they deserve it, but because for my own sake and for the sake of my servant, David. Now, I know you guys are thinking, wait a minute, David didn't prove faithful. This covenant that the Lord made with David was not conditional on what David did with his life. What David did with his life would actually come under the same terms as, as these Davidic kings. You know, you, you keep my covenant, you do what's right, I bless you, you do what's wrong, and you're going to have a, um, a consequence pretty immediate too because you're in this relationship with me i'm your father you are my son i will protect this city for the sake of my servant david now in the next chapter it's about king hezekiah and king hezekiah is suffering with a terrible illness nigh unto death and he's mourning because he his his kingship is going to be cut short a righteous davidic king usually reigned for 40 years and, and he hasn't had his reign and there's a he's threatened to die and he's praying to the lord to to help him and the lord says in chapter 38 verse 6 i will deliver you and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will protect this city. So again, we have a promise from the Lord he's going to deliver, but here's the fascinating thing. In 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 6, it tells a little bit more of the story, and it puts both of those verses that are separated a chapter apart in Isaiah in one verse in 2 Kings. Hezekiah. I will add unto thy days 15 years. Because he's been faithful through all of the suffering that he's been through, the Lord is promising him that he's going to spare his life. 
and add unto him fifteen years. And in the very next line, same verse, And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and I will defend this city for my own sake and for my servant David. The scriptures knitting two concepts together, that the city is being protected because of the faithfulness of the king. That's just a little scripture backing to show you what's going on with the Davidic covenant. Now here in Mosiah chapter 23, we have this very interesting verse. I don't know if you were going to quote it in your lesson, but this might be one that, that he's going to talk about next time. And the people were desirous that Alma, Alma Sr., when, when they all came back uh, to Zarahemla, should be their king, for he was beloved by his people. And his son rebelled against him. And he said unto them, Behold, it is not expedient that we should have a king. For thus saith the Lord, ye shall not esteem, esteem, now get this, one flesh above another, or one man shall not think of himself above another. Therefore I say unto you, it is not expedient that you should have a king. So we're talking about, when he says it's not expedient, that you should have a king. He's talking about men in the flesh, right? Seems like your reference is off. He's going to differentiate right here in verse eight. Nevertheless, if it were possible that you could have just men to be your kings, if you could have a righteous king, it would be well for you to have a king. That's why it is so beautiful that God is our king because he will sacrifice for us. He does care about us more than himself. Let's go into uh, the statistics here. If you just look at Israel as the example, ancient Israel, what is your odds of getting a righteous king. One out of eight you got there in the bottom line there. Out of 39 total kings of Judah and Israel, in Judah they had five that were righteous and 15 that were wicked. And in Israel, all 19 are classified as wicked in the scriptures. That is odds of one in eight kings being righteous, being being the kind of king that King Benjamin was, the kind of king that Mosiah was. So when you have a failure of a king to be righteous, you have the failure of the blessings that were attached to the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant blessings are that you will have a promised land that, that, that will be protected and that your posterity will be protected. Because few kings were loyal to God, the kingdom was divided into two. All of Israel will be exiled from the land because of the unrighteous, the, the, the failure to keep a Davidic covenant. But before we point fingers, only two of the original 12 apostles at the restoration stayed faithful. We had the church that stayed with Emma in Nauvoo and the church that moved west is split. And we had an extermination order from Missouri. Same thing happens without a Joseph, without a righteous king that will intercede and a people that will be faithful to that king. In that case, the Davidic covenant is invoked. And that covenant that God made with David, that he would honor that paradigm throughout all the ages was irrevocable. And it didn't matter what David did. Jeremiah chapter 33, and this is an amazing verse. David will never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel. And to back that promise up, God says, if you can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, that there should not be day or night in their season. Then also may my covenant be broken with David, my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne. 
Now, if you go, notice I quoted verse 17 and 20 to 21. If you go and read that whole chapter, you'll see that the Lord also promised that they would be restored and offer offerings in Jerusalem. Again, with that edict from God, it's hmm. not possible for me to break that covenant. So again, this is the way a Davidic covenant functions. If a king is loyal to God under all conditions, usually pretty life-threatening conditions like David was in when Saul was trying to take his life and he was faithful to God in all circumstances till later. That's when the Lord said, I will make an unbreakable, unrevocable covenant with you. And guys, this is so important because when we go to the temple, we are kings and queens. And if we're not righteous kings and queens that can make a covenant like Alma when he prayed for his son or like King Mosiah when he's praying for his sons, then we won't have the power in our, our prayers to affect those kind of answers. But we can, we can rise up to that if we understand what we're supposed to do. If we understand that our part is to be willing to do whatever, whatever the Lord asks, we can bring that kind of power down in our families. And he, Alma Sr., caused that the priests should assemble themselves together when he found out what had happened to Alma. And they were fasted and prayed that the Lord God would open the mouth of Alma that he might speak and that his limbs might receive their strength, that the eyes of the people might be open to see and know the goodness and glory of God. And it came to pass that they fasted and prayed for two days and two nights. Okay, now that should be like a red flag that tells you that what we're about to read after two days and two nights is going to be a type and a shadow of the conversion of the Lamanites, of the restoration of the branch of Lehi and, and of Israel in America in the latter days. You're going to see other word links that you're going to pick that up as well. But the two days and the two nights is the two days of the time of the Gentiles. It's the 2,000 years since Christ came. And now, as the millennial day is ushered in, Israel is restored in the third day. Now, in verse 32, And it came to pass that Alma began from this time forward to teach the people and those who were with Alma. So it's a little different than Paul in the New Testament. In that story, Paul saw, here's the angel, but the people that are with him did not. They, they don't. They just see the earthquake and the bright light. In the Book of Mormon, the sons of Mosiah that were with him see the angel as well. Those were, that were with Alma at the time the angel appeared to them, and they were traveling round about through all the land. They're traveling round about through all the land, publishing to all the people the things which they have heard and seen, and preaching the word of God in much tribulation. That's another clue right there. Being persecuted. Look, the, the time of tribulation on the earth, being greatly persecuted by those who were unbelievers and being smitten by many of them. Now, in Mosiah chapter 37, I, we learn about Alma's experience. When he, he gets time out for two days and two nights, at which time when he wakes up, he can't bear to think of anyone going through that. And he will spend the rest of his life preaching to try and bring souls to Christ so that they don't have to suffer this. But when you get to Alma 36, Alma is old, and he's giving his sons his final blessing. And in Alma chapter 36, he retells this story 
But this time, he's had time to write it in a beautiful chiasm. And he says, my son, give ear to my words in the first verse. And in the 30th verse, he says, this is according to his word. So there again, you have a title, listen to my words. And he is going to structure his experience where he was born of God and that he was paralyzed and that he suffered the pains of a damned soul at the point of hopelessness. He remembered Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and he cries, Lord, have mercy on me. That's the turning point of the chiasm in Alma 36. We learn more about the involvement of the sons of Mosiah in the, in the whole story and everything in Mosiah 27. So it's really fun to compare the two because there's different items in both chapters. But it's just another example of the beauty encasing the word of God in chiastic structures that survive through translation. Rhyming words wouldn't survive a translation. The chiasms stay in the translations, especially if the translator is aware of what is what's going on in the original, so he can try and use similar words to in the translation process. After the sons of Mosiah had done all of these things, all of the preaching that they've done, all of, and and the the friends that rejected them and the persecutions that they received, they took a small number with them. And they'd gone throughout all the land, and they returned to their father, King Mosiah, and they desired of him that he would grant unto them that they might, when these, with these whom they had selected, go up to the land of Nephi. So we often see four, you know, the four sons of Mosiah, Aaron, Ammon, Omner, and Himnah, but they actually took a small number with them. We're going to actually find two of their names of the other guys that went with them when Aaron gets thrown into prison because it names them them. In Mosiah 28, continuing, Now they were desirous that salvation should be declared to every creature, for they could not bear that any human soul should perish. Yea, even the very thought that any soul should endure endless torment did cause them to quake and tremble. That was some reality check. And in, in some ways it helps me understand why Lehi said you have to have opposition in all things. Anybody? And thus did the Spirit of the Lord work upon them, for they were the very vilest of sinners. That should give us hope. And the Lord saw fit in his infinite mercy to spare them. Nevertheless, they suffered much anguish of soul because of their iniquities. Suffering much and fearing that they should be cast off forever. And it came to pass that they did plead with their father many days that they might go up to the land of Nephi. And King Mosiah went and inquired of the Lord if he should let his sons go up among the Lamanites to preach the word. Now watch again. That's a bother. King invoking a Davidic covenant. Watch here. Can you can you imagine King Mosiah saying, Lord, I'll do anything, just keep them, keep them safe while they're on their mission. And the Lord said to Mosiah, let them go up. For many shall believe on their words, and they shall have eternal life. And I will deliver thy sons out of the hands of the Lamanites. So you have King Mosiah, faithful to God, and his sons faithful to him. And you have the protection of a Davidic covenant being invoked. I will deliver thy sons. When you have a Davidic covenant being invoked like this, it doesn't mean it's easy. Right. Seldom is anything easy. Yeah. I think it's kind of designed that way because we become refined gold with test and trial. We the, apply enough heat. I will purge the sons of Levi and like gold. We're jumping ahead to Aaron and a certain number of his brethren were taken and cast into prison. 
and the remainder of them fled out of the land of Midonai unto the regions round about. And those who were cast into prison suffered many things. And they were delivered by the hand of Lamoni and Ammon, and they were fed and clothed. And we'll learn more about that story when we get to Alma chapter 20 in that flashback that we talked about. But when we talk about the story of Ammon, we often don't realize that three of his brethren are suffering terribly. And Ammon weeps when he sees them and he sees what they've suffered. No offering, no willing sacrifice ever goes unanswered. It has power to reverse curses. It has power to save people. Their willingness to do that. Not everybody gets to be the Ammon guy. <coughs> That, that, that gets empowered to, to whack everybody's arms off and, and, and be the hero of right. the story. Aaron and Molokai and Amma are just as much heroes languishing in prison that the word can go forth. And when they're released, they go forth again to declare the word. And thus they were delivered for the first time out of prison and thus they had suffered. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. So I'm pretty sure that's from Alma 20, and that reference in Mosiah 28 is wrong, but I didn't change it. Now back to Mosiah 28. This is our last chapter, and the entire chapter is a chiasm. So let's look at Mosiah 28 and see what Mormon is wanting to focus in on. King Mosiah had no one to confer the kingdom upon, for there were none of any of his sons that would accept the kingdom. So they're, they're not interested in the politics. They're interested in saving souls. Notice the colors and everything, because this is the first half of the chiasm. And, you, and you're going to, you'll see that it's going to be talking about kings and lands in the, in the last part there. He took the records, which were engraven on the plates of brass and the plates of Nephi and all the things that he had kept and preserved according to the commandments of God. And notice if, if anything that's highlighted in blue, those same words are in the parallel at the end of the chapter. I've only highlighted the things that are in parallel. Okay, so that was element B. While Mosiah's sons are out on their missions, he is translating and causing to be written the records which were on the plates of gold that Limhi brought to him. Do you know what book that is? Ether. In the bottom half, it says something really interesting about the book of Ether in the bottom half of this chiasm. So remember, that part's going to be in the blue. And this he did because of great anxiety of his people, super beyond measure, wanted to know what was on those gold plates. <laughs> That's an interesting thing for Mormon to emphasize. I don't know anybody that super really wants to know what's in the same portion of the Book of Mormon, do you? <laughs> no. Concerning those people who had been destroyed, destroy is going to be your linking word that's going to be in element D in the second half. Now, this is the part that's interesting as we get to the middle. It's talking about the Urim and Thummim. Yeah, I think it's fascinating that bringing up the year. That that's going to be the focus here as we're nearing the end of the book of Isaiah. And now he translated them by means of the two stones that were fashioned into the two rims of a bow. And now these things were prepared from the beginning. And now we get probably the coolest definition of why God prepared the Urim and Thummim from the beginning that I've seen. I kind of knew the first part, but the second part was kind of blew my mind. And these were handed down from generation to generation for the purpose of interpreting languages. I think we all knew that part, right? Well, this is the part that kind of blew my mind. And they have been kept and preserved by the hand of the Lord that he should discover to every creature who should possess the land the iniquities and the abominations of his people. That is fascinating. A record being kept that their judgments will be just. Because this is 
a record of the iniquities and the abominations of the people, as well as their righteous acts. And so here it's turning around in verse 16. We're now in the bottom half. Here are these things. The Mosiah had finished translating. It's about people that were destroyed. And remember, I told you in element D, there'd be something um, that, well, actually, it's in element C. That we get something really interesting about the Book of Ether. Number one, the Book of Ether actually goes back to creation, the creation of Adam. The Book of Ether that we now have in the Book of Mormon that was abridged by Moroni, he says in the beginning of the Book of Ether, I'm not going to say all that stuff that was in on the brass plates. I'm just going to pick it up from the Tower of Babel. I can't wait to get the part that was about back to Adam, all the little details that we can compare with Genesis and fill in the story. Yeah, I don't know anybody who's anxious about knowing what's in those other records. <laughs> this uh, account did cause the people of Mosiah to mourn exceedingly. And this account, which will be written hereafter, this is interesting because Moroni must have been studying the book and said, hey, dad didn't put this in here. I, I got to put this in here. And this account shall be written hereafter. For behold, it is expedient that all people should know the things that are in the book of Ether. And all we have is the abridgment of it. I am excited to find what else was on those 24 gold plates. After King Mosiah had done these things, he took the plates of brass, all the things he had kept and preserved that he was commanded that were handed down from one generation to another. I love that part too, because Wayne May told a story of one of the tribes back east, the tribes of uh, Indians back east, and they said that they were that their tribe were the record keepers. And they were super embarrassed to tell people that they are by generation the record keepers. Because the records were buried in a hill, and they don't know where the hill is. And that's their story. Just fascinating that these records were handed down from generation to generation. That means there's somebody's responsibility today. Now, when Mosiah had done this, he sent out throughout the land among the people desiring to know who would be their king. And they chose Aaron. So apparently they didn't know Aaron <laughs> was about to go to the Lamanites and get thrown in prison. That kind of leads into you. Mosiah chapter 29 and the establishment of a not kingdom in the land of Zarahemla. Next time. It's going to be wonderful again to uh, meet with you again and go through the next lesson, which is going to be kind of a little bit on righteous government. Um, that being said, thank you. This has been great and Till next time.